maintaining within young people in particular, but not just necessarily young people, a sense of engagement to the greater part of the community and the wider community in which they live, and at the same time asserting their own individual individuality, is not something that is an easy task. In the past, in all of our respective jurisdictions on these two islands, there were very strong um, external forces. We tended to have been, in a previous generation, born into a class, born into a religion, born into a football club support, and born into a trade union. We arrived more or less with a heritage given at birth, which very few people challenged, and which wasn't necessarily challenged in the place in which you grew up. And along with that was a devotion to, or a sense of obligation to the state, and consequently a, a responsibility to be a citizen. It didn't have to be taught. It was, so to speak, there for all sorts of reasons, some of them good, some of them bad, war and service and military commitment being a part of it. Um, that is no longer the case with many, many people, notwithstanding the commitment of our defense forces and all of our jurisdictions uh, to carry out their tasks. Our newly elected president, Michael D. Higgins, in his inauguration speech, stated that we require a transition in our political thinking, in our view of the public world, and in our institutions, and most difficult of all, in our consciousness. On this island, there is a whole new generation coming to terms with an extraordinary, historic, conciliatory, peaceful accommodation, as the Italian communist leader many years ago talked about the historic compromise. People on this island have made a historic compromise in relation to the recognition of the validity of the presence on both sides of a rapidly lowering border of the legitimacy of people to be here. On the other island, Britain, you yourselves, those of you who are most welcome to these shores, are going through something that perhaps is not that evident as you see it on a daily basis. But the transformation in Scotland and to a lesser extent in Wales and in England and within the north and south of England is something that in 50 years time will be I suggest, described as a momentous transition in the composition of the way in which people on the island of Britain relate to each other. Now, when those kind of political loyalties and symbols and signs and flags and instruments and titles and all the things that go with it, when they start to change, and they are changing, Tom Nairn has written about this very extensively, um, the inner empire and the outer empire, of which this country is an intrinsic part, and in which this very building is an intrinsic part. So we feel close to you in that particular journey that you're engaged upon. But because it's a long, slow journey, it's like sitting in a train that doesn't seem to be moving. But believe you me, it is moving. Maintaining the commitment to citizenship, maintaining the sense of involvement, maintaining the sense of engagement, maintaining a sense that, you know, the rest of the community is not viewed through the X Factor on a TV flat screen uh, with a can of beer or a glass of wine or a cup of tea. Uh, these are serious challenges. For the normal, average, reasonably well educated, reasonably well employed, reasonably well brought up in terms of a reasonably functioning family, uh, that's a relatively easy task to, to ask and to expect from. But our difficulty in this country, and I suspect in your jurisdictions as well, is not all of us are in that relatively happy position. And we have people who, in my own constituency, which includes the area where we are now, uh, people who are disconnecting and disconnected from society. So your task of a family and of a person who was not born into the kind of inheritance that I described at the outset of my comments, uh, is much more difficult. So the fact that you are formally organized, the fact that 10 delegates come from each of the five jurisdictions, the fact that you have, loosely but broadly speaking, an educational background in the sort of the further ed area, I think is very significant. But it says to me, uh, and quite frankly I didn't know of your formal existence until about three, four days ago, but what it does say to me is this, 
that you've identified that there is an issue. Secondly, you've identified that the issue has to be addressed. And thirdly, you're looking at ways how that can be addressed. And you know, given this island, given the fact that Croatia will become the 28th member of the European Union in less than a year's time, and that there's about five other member, potential member states who want to join. The allegiance to locations of authority and power and decision making in the world into which we have embarked after the Second World War is an extraordinary challenging task. Extraordinary challenging task. Umberto Eco, the, the wonderful Italian intellectual and author of The Name of the Road, but much more things, talked about the, the disappearance of nationalism being squeezed from two centres, the centre of localism, such as in Catalonia, or in Scotland, or in Bavaria, uh, on the one hand, the emergence of loyalty to a city-state, which is not that normal, because that's what most Europeans had long before they were nationalists. Nationalism is a very rare, recent child on the, on the planet of, of uh, political totem poles. But the squeeze back down to the immediate area from which you come, and the greater area to which you see the necessity for regulation, which is the OECD uh, in terms of education and standards, uh, the WTO, uh, the United Nations, uh, the successor to the Kyoto, um, in relation to climate change. We've become very powerful at the local level, as we always were, and we have discovered that there are limits to the powers of nations in terms of regulation, powers and forces that don't recognize, recognize national boundaries. So your task, it seems to me, is compounded by how do you attract the allegiance and the acknowledgement and the sense of loyalty to a nation state which is seen to be powerless in terms of trade, in terms of globalization, in terms of migration, on the one hand, and a city place where your childcare, your elderly care, and your education, and your culture, and your fun, and your place, and your sense of friends is clearly located. These are challenges that no previous generation ever had to face. We are on uncharted waters for which there are no maps. Nobody has gone before where we were. Even if you think of the Roman Empire, it was the dominant nation state whose writ ran right across the rest of Europe and North Africa because it was so culturally and organizationally and technically so superior and it had a common language and a common currency. So how you embed, how you enthuse, because citizenship national citizenship was fueled, fueled by a sense of enthusiasm. Uh, there were songs, there were emblems, there were emblems, there were, there were uh, processions, there were badges, there were associations. Uh, and, it, and it didn't happen by accident. If you, if you read Norman Davis's uh, history of this, these isles, and he talks about how Great Britain came about, it makes um, spin doctors of new labor look like amateurs in terms of how you know the royal family rediscovered the tartans how you know balmoral suddenly came about how the firstborn was the prince of wales this didn't happen casually very clever people thought about how they would bind together a disparate set of peoples not just within england but on these two islands and it worked extraordinarily well it worked extraordinarily well uh, so you have a task, and I'll finish on this point. Think of where your great-grandchildren are going to be towards the end of this century, since we're still only in the beginning of the second decade. Think of 1811, or 1911, and think of 2011, and just think of where people were at that point in time. Two, three years after, not even, but in the space of the Battle of Waterloo with the Vienna Congress and the setting to the whole of Europe. What kind of world are they going to be? How will they maintain a sense of loyalty to, and a sense of duty, because that's the other side of citizenship, 
to the space and place in which they lived. And how will that generation, a fourth generation of Europeans, who for the first time in 500 years will no longer dominate the world's agenda? No longer dominate the world's agenda. Two things happened in 1492. The Moors, the Arabs, our modern day Islamic migrants who taught us how to think, who taught us how to add, and taught us algebra, who taught us a numerical system that works, unlike the Roman system that never worked. Imagine doing quadratic equations in Roman numerals. <laughs> For the first time in 500 years, we expelled that center of civilization from the Iberian Peninsula, and we discovered, with only the arrogance that Europeans can command, the whole new world of Latin America, what became Latin America, and uh, North America. And for the subsequent 500 years, as Paul Kennedy has pointed out so eloquently in his book, uh, The Rise and Fall of Great Nations, we actually dominated that agenda <coughs> and wrote the script and decided who got what, when, and where, sometimes in a very bloody fashion, of which our five nations and our five jurisdictions were an integral, integral part, including the Republic of Ireland through the Republic. We're in denial about that incident, but we're beginning to, to realize that we were as much complicit in it as everybody else in these two islands. Your great-grandchildren in 2091 are going to be confronting a different kind of world. So how do we instill in them, in the same way that our grandparents instilled in us, a sense of belonging, a sense of love, a sense of care, a sense of pride and a sense of tolerance for difference within the nation, within the community. That's the challenge. You're laying the foundations. I wish you well and I wish you every success in your two days conference here. Thank you very much indeed.